Well, let's get started. So today's we are going to have the lecture two, part two of the generative adversarial network. And during my talking, uh, just a double confirmation, uh, the thing is working on the live stream, right? Uh, okay. No feedback. It is working. So, yeah, let's get started. Here is today's agenda. We are going to start with a short wrap up for what has happened in last Wednesday and something new. We start with here. Sorry, wait a sec. That's a wrong slide I've shown here. One second. That's not my slide. This is one. This thing. is the slide, okay. Yeah. So, so what are guns? Basically, the guns are just the generative adversarial network. And we just split into three words. Generative means it is generative model, which means that it's trying to learn the underlying distribution from which our data sets that comes from. It is trying to learn a joint distribution of our data from both X and Y. And adversarial means that we are performing adversarial training. That is, it is not only made up with the generator, but also we are going to have an a adversarial network, which is both two are trying to beat each other. Oops. And network simply means that is a neural network. And our goal here is just trying to generate data from the unlabeled distribution. And here's the pool. At 1949. Uh, just try it. I just published it. All right, very easy pool, right? So how to train the gun? It is also covered in the pool that at time zero, we are going to train our discriminator first. But in order to train our discriminator, we need to some input of the discriminator. First, the real data that is given, which is the training data for our discriminator. And, but we also need the fake data in order to train this binary classifier. So those fake data are simply the output of our generator. And the input of our generator are just some latent vectors that are sampled from the prior distribution, which is normally Gaussian, as covered in the last lecture. And we are, at, at time zero, we are likely to get some of the noise here that it is shown, right? And after training our discriminator, we just perform the iterative training of our discriminator and generator. And we, let's get a little bit closer look. In order to train our discriminator, uh, the discriminator is just a binary classifier cl classifying data into real and false. And the real data simply means that's a real data. False data means that it's output of our generator. And the goal here, we have two goals of the discriminator. Once that, we want to maximize the chances that real data are classified as real data. And also we want to maximize the chances that fake data are classified as fake data. Any question? All right. To train our generator, uh, we have the goal here for the generator that is, it wants to maximize the chance that generated data are classified incorrectly by the discriminator which means that those fake data are classified as true data by the discriminator. 
good. And in order to make some mathematical formulation for our thing, we just had this, all this notation here. Like we have the parameterized discriminator, the parameterized generator, and the PD is simply for, for the actual data distribution, the generated, generated data distribution, and the output of the discriminator, output of generator. Good. And one thing to note, notice here is that uh, the probability, uh, di the output of the discriminator also could be interpreted as the probability that X came from actual data distribution, PD. Which, uh, in that case, your discriminator is using a softmax at the end of the layer to make its output to be a probability, which is, may not be the case when we are seeing the, w, the ori original version of WGAN which uh, the output of the critique is not a probability, which will be covered later. And also the GZ, which is the output of the generator, is following the PG distribution. Good. For the discriminator, we have two goals. One is to, I don't want to repeat it, it's on slides. So we write it into the mathematical form, which is uh, for X that, is fault, X that is sampled from the real data distribution, the DX is maximized, and for X that is from the distribution of the generator, the DX is minimized. And we perform one step forward, which is we add a log. As you see that the log here is simply a keep, is monotically increasing function, so it will not change the shape or change the direction of our goal. We're still trying to maximize the log dx. And on the other hand, on the other side, because like we use the log one, which is equal to zero, which is zero minus log dx, which is we also want to maximize this goal. Okay. We perform one more step, which is we perform the integration of the function we are having here. So we are basically calculating the expectation of those two functions. And yeah, we, in order to put it into, in order to also consider rate the effects of the generator, we simply make the change here to make the Z that is from the uh, latent vector distribution, which is PZ and the input is, is become GZ. And the goal of the discriminator just become the following function, which is because it wants to maximize this one, it is want to maximize the right one. So it's just trying to maximize the summation of these two, which is the end of this part. Any question? We're just basically covering what has been covered in last Wednesday. All right, for a generator, we have one goal, which is just to try to maximize the chance that the generated data are classified incorrectly by discriminator. So we started with, for any Z that is belong to the latent vector distribution, we want the DGZ is maximized. And we add the log, still maximizing it. We change its direction by, by putting a minus sign here, and we try to minimize this one. We are going to, we also perform the integration for this function for, of the log. And then we are basically calculating the integration, the expectation of the function inside the expectation sign, which is trying to minimize that one. And to minimize that function is simply, equivalent to minimize its summation with some mysterious constants. So, and we change the mysterious constants to become something on the left. And then, yeah, as you can see, we, perf we put it into the mathematical form. We, we change the parameter of generator and trying to minimize all this equation. Looks good. Any question? 
if there's any question, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay. So if you trust my technique for control C and control V, uh, these two functions are just copied from previous slides. For discriminator, we have this objective. And for generator, we have the following objective. And as you could spot, those two equations are the same. So we put them together to formulate our Gans objective, which is this one. And yeah, here up to now everything is correct. Everything is right. Okay. And in order to max to calculate the max and mean, because that that is some difficult formulation because like we want to maximize with with some parameters and minimize it with some parameters, and for the first step we are performing is simply to calculate the derivative with respect to the the discriminator. We just we're just dealing with the inside part, which is max, maximize the function to, uh, with respect to the theta d here. And for all those derivation, after all those derivation, we got dx equal to the proportional dis, uh, proportion of the probability of the discriminator divided by the probability of it's from the generator plus is the probability is from the discriminant. Or it's from the real data, right? So after getting this dx, we, we plug it back. And mysteriously, we found that it is equivalent with the GS divergence, Jason Shannon divergence, minus some log uh, constants, right? So in that case, we've already got rid of the inside part, of, which is the maximization part. And everything left is just the minimization with respect to the parameter of the generator. So for our generator, our goal just become this one. We're just trying to minimize the, the GSD between the real distribution and the generator generated distribution which is the thing that we just, we mentioned at the beginning of our, of today's lecture. Sounds good? This one? This one? Okay. Better? Better? And yeah, the GANS objective has been covered for a uh, plus the gas uh, in addition to the gas objective that is minimize the GSD between the real data distribution and the generated data distribution we are having we also having some training issue that is the mean max stationary points uh, so we say we say that Mani I think Manish says that the mean max stationary points exist and it need not to be stable all right, everything is good now. Any question? Yeah, if no more question, uh, that's all for my part. And I will hand over to my partner, Diksha. Am I audible? I think till the last. So basically, in the last lecture, you would have studied about the overtraining of GANs and it can cause oscillations. So basically, like this is a small example of how you can explain about the oscillations in GAN using a rock, paper, scissor game. Picture, thumb 
Is it not clear? Okay. Is it fine now? Speak for a no. Okay. So basically now I think in high school most of the people would have played this game, the rock, paper, scissor game. Or should I explain this? How do you play the game? The audience is still not clear. Explaining it that. Keep the mic closer to your mouth. Is it fine now? Is it fine now? Okay, so I think most of the people know about this game. The rock, paper, scissors game. So now just consider that I am one player in the game and the probability of me playing in the game is 0 0.36, 0 0.32 and 0 0.32. So if one of you is playing the game, what will you choose to defeat me? Like anyone can tell that? Right? So and what is the probability of winning in the game? 36% right? Because if you choose an opposition, paper and I and for me the probability of the rock is 36 so the probability of winning in this game is 36 now consider another case when I am playing with 0 0.33 0 0.33 and 0 0.33 so in that case what will you choose what will be the strategy anyone to defeat me in the game what will you choose anyone right there yeah, any random strategy will be fine. And the probability of winning will be 33%. So basically, when, the, when this condition occurs, this is called a global optimum in a game. Because in this case, the probability is same for all of my strategies. 0 0.33, 0 0.33 and 0 0.33. So now what happens in the GAN is like, I would like to explain like how oscillation is happening. So for this, we will consider that I am playing the game with 0 0.36, 0 0.32 and 0 0.32. Now suppose I give a chance to the player B and he has a chance to optimize. So what will he choose? Can anyone of you tell? If I play with 0 0.36, 0 0.32 and 0 0.32 to win against me. So for paper? Paper, right. So once the player B has chosen paper, now what should I choose? to defeat the player B. Right. So, and then again now, the player A knows my strategy, right? So what will he choose? The player B. Yeah. So the thing is, this will keep on going, right? There's no end to it. You can always, this is what is called actual an oscillation. So this game will never end. So basically, instead of doing this, what they would have done ideally? Anyone? I mean, how can you reach the optimum in the game instead of how can you achieve a stability? Because in this way, there will be an infinite oscillation. It will keep on coming, right? This game will never end. So can anyone tell what should be done? What? Yeah. So basically you go with the running weights and basically both of them should try to achieve 0 0.33, 0 0.33 and 0 0.33, right? So at the end, it should stop at 0.33. So this is basically this is an example, a small example which illustrates that how can you explain the oscillations in GAN. So there are two kind of training issues which are present in the GAN. One is the oscillation, so I've illustrated that with example and one is the mode collapse. So for this, I'd like to show a video. Yeah, so I'm going to his office now. 
can you share? Is it not? Uh, is it not getting shared? Share the screen. One second, why is this not getting shared? Yeah, maybe we'll just skip it. Why is this not getting shared? I think maybe we'll just skip it. Yeah. I'm so sorry, but just one second. Could we just skip it? No, I want to talk about this. I don't know, I don't think we can share it. Because that's a sharing problem. Okay, so basically I'll just go over the video later on. At the end of the class, I can just show the video. So basically what mode collapse is, now what is happening is generator will actually generate the image. So the issue is that the generator will generate a small subspace of, space of images over the entire distribution. So this will lead to mode collapse. Now there was a paper which was proposed in 2016, which gives improved techniques for the training of GAN. So there are a lot of techniques which have been proposed for the GAN improvement. Now they are like feature mapping, mini batch discrimination, historical averaging, one side smoothing, and virtual batch normalization. I'll just give a brief over all this and later on you guys can go and refer to the original GAN paper. So first of all, I would like, I would like to talk about what actually mode collapse is. So what happens is, the generator is generating images, right? So the thing is, the images, so if you see the MNIC data set, it is actually generating the numbers. So what happens is, it is generating the numbers one by one. So when the discriminator is trying to see, it is only able to see that, it is seeing that the generator is doing its work. But the issue is that the generator is not generating all the images. So this is leading to mode collapse because the loss will be very less and the gradient value will also be very less. So to tackle these problems, there were various techniques which are proposed. The first was feature mapping. So in case of feature mapping, basically what we will do is we will train the generator to minimize the L2 between the real and the generated data. And for the discriminator, we will try to maximize the L2 between the real and generated data. So if you see the mathematical equation for this, so we are taking an L2 norm over the expectation of the discriminator output and the expected value of the generator output. Now the second technique which was proposed was mini batch discrimination. Now this is a very popular technique and this is the one which is used to counter mode collapse. So basically I just gave an overview of mode collapse right. So what is happening is from the discriminator point of view, it is not able to tell that generator, like discriminator cannot say that generator is not working because generator is generating the images. The only issue is it is generating over a small subspace. So now how can you tackle this issue? Anyone? So basically what is happening is this, only numbers are coming one by one right. So how can I improve this is, I will try to give a batch of images and I will try to apply some transformations to them and then I will try to give it to my discriminator so that it can make better decisions, right? So this is all is mini batch discrimination. So basically, now I will try to give a batch to my discriminator and I will apply some transformations to it and the decisions which the discriminator will make will be quite better. And this will help to improve the performance. The third technique which was proposed was historical averaging. Now this technique is not used that much and it is quite a regularization technique and it is not a very popular technique. It's just basically now the thing is since I explained about the oscillations in GAN, right? So you don't want your parameters to oscillate. You want your parameters to be near the mean value. So in that case, you will be using historical averaging. And the mathematical formula is this. Now there was one more technique which was from, which was, which came up, which was one side label smoothing. Now one side label smoothing is basically instead of choosing zero and one as your labels for your one hot encoders, now you will you can give values like 0 0.01, 0 0.99, like these kind of values. So basically this technique, it will help the discriminator to not overtrain. The sigmoid will not saturate. 
and this is one of the last technique which was proposed this was virtual batch normalization so basically in this technique you will take a batch of real data and then you will see the shift and variance in the batch over the real data and then you will apply the normalization on the data so i have like kind of covered all the techniques which were proposed in the improvement for the gan and i will recommend you guys to go to the paper the original gan paper which came up i think next next part chiran will take where is he where is he I'm waiting for him. Actually, he has to continue. Just wait for five minutes, guys. I think he went to get a microphone from professor's office. Yeah. I Yeah, I'll just check that out. I was just trying to share the video for the mode collapse for the vanilla gan. I think you can take over from this part. So sorry for the delay. Can you? Yeah. Sorry to double check whether it's working on the streamline. Much better. Sorry about that, guys. So, Dick just already covered all the part for the training issues again, and also the guns training and stabilization, right? So I'm gonna introduce some form of 
some new form of the gun, which is the Wasser Stein gun. <sighs> so just as a recap, previously we introduced the VAE, which is using the KL divergence, and we have the vanilla guns, which is trying to minimize the GS divergence. For, there are some problems with the, both KL divergence and GS divergence. As you could re, uh, remember that the GS divergence is simply a symmetric form of the KL divergence. So let's make an example here. Suppose that we have two distribution, one is PX, one is QX, where PX has only a pulse function at x equals to zero, where the integration equal to one and it has takes no, uh, takes only the value x equal to zero on its axis. And QX has a similar form, uh, however the its distribution is only at x equal to one. So we also characterize theta as the distance between those two peaks of the two distributions. And if we are using the KL divergence to measure the distance between these two distributions, we can find that if theta is not equal to zero, the KL divergence equal to one. Uh, KL divergence equal to infinity. And if theta is equal to zero, we can find the KL divergence equal to zero. It basically is saying that we could know whether they are the two district the two same distribution. However, we, we, there's, the KL divergence provide us no information for how different those two distributions are. And also, by the way, it is not differentiable with respect to theta. For GS divergence, it is simply a symmetric form of the KL divergence. And now surprisingly, if theta is not equal to zero, which means there are two distributions, we have the GS divergence at log four. And if theta is zero, which means they are the same distribution, we have the GS divergence equal to zero. And also it is not differentiable with respect to theta. Everything's good now. Any question? Uh, if there's no question, there's a pool now. All right, time's up. As you can see that the problem here is that both the KL divergence and GS divergence do not tell us how far are we that we currently are with respect to the true distribution. So actually it is just telling the generator, no, you are not giving, it simply means that the discriminator is, is keep telling the generator, no, you are not correct, but it doesn't tell him like how to be correct, right? And also, by the way, they are not differentiable with respect to the distance. So, uh, so we are desiring something that could tell us like how far away that we are with respect to the true distribution, in which way we could, prefer, and also if that could be differentiable with the distance, that would be better. So we could pr just perform the gradient descent something algorithm on that, right? So for that, we introduced the Wasserstein distance, which could also be called earth mover distance. And the dis this is the distance defined on probability distributions. And intuitively speaking, it's just the minimal cost of turning one pile of dirt into another pile of dirt when both distributions are treated as piles of dirt. Sounds good? And also intuitively speaking, it is simply the total summation of the mass times the mean distance required to transform one distribution to another. And for example, here we have all those red points. You see the slide. We have all those red points as one distribution and all those blue points as another distribution. And in order to move 
from the red distribution to the blue distribution, we could match the, uh, for example, we move this red point here from here to here, and move this point from here to here. However, we could, uh, we could do another different kind of matching. We could move this point from here to actually become this blue point. And we move this one from here to here. You see, the, dis the distance is changing, but however, we just want the minimum, minimum total, dis total cost for changing all those red points to all those blue points. Sounds good? So mathematically speaking, we are having this terrible equation here where the, you can see the pi PR, wait, the pi PR and pi and PG here. It means the joint distribution of the, of the joint distribution of the real data points and the generated data points. And the gamma is one of the realization of this joint distribution. So we sample one gamma here, and from this gamma, we could have x and y, which is sampled from this gamma distribution. You can see the gamma is a joint distribution. We sample a joint point from this joint distribution, and we calculate its L1 distance between these two points. And calculate, and because this is, the gamma is a distribution, we could take an integration of the thing inside it, and thus calculate the expectation. For all those expectations, which means for all those gammas, we want the inf of all those gammas. Yeah, we want the inf of that, which is exactly the thing that we are talking about. You could also consider gamma as a plan for moving piles from one distribution to another. And among all those points, we just want one to give us the minimal cost which is the definition of the, the earth mover's distance here. Sounds great. Any question? Any questions online? Hi. Mm -hmm. So the inf here is uh, kind of like a minimum of infinity? Or? Yeah, you like, from, I think from the scope of this course, you could simply uh, consider it as the minimum here. Because like that's some very, mm, yeah, you could simply, cons intuitively speaking, you could simply consider it as a minimum here. Thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'm moving, okay. After we have already di uh, introduced the earth mover's distance, I'm sorry that to calculate, or to, ca uh, to call it as earth mover distance, because I don't know how to pronounce this, this word. What's this thing? Maybe. So still, we have the same example here. We have one distribution Px, one distribution Qx. The Px is, has a pulse at x to zero, the Qx has a pulse at x equal to one. Magino magically, we see that the, dis uh, the distance between those two, the Wasser distance, distance between those two become the absolute value of theta. All right, and the it is even differentiable with respect to theta. Sounds good? So, and some of the experiments also done for the uh, earth mover distance with, and also the JS distance. Uh, the right, the left one is the distance, the, uh, is the earth mover's distance for two distributions when those two distributions are trying to move closer to each other and move apart from each other. And a similar thing for the right-hand side, which is just the matter for GSD for the similar case. You can see that the GSD also always give you some value as constant, unless they are, you are having the same distribution here. However, the earth mover distance trying to give you some of the hints for where the true distance is. And by using this L1 distance, uh, the thing that we are introducing is using the L1 distance measure of the move, earth mover distance. So you can see that we can figure out the true distribution is kind of here, so we could move from here to here, 
or from here to here. Sounds good? All right, that's the story so far. For VAE, we have the KL divergence. For vanilla guns, we have the GS divergence. And for W guns, we have earth mover distance. So we get back to the, uh, to the definition of the earth mover distance. We, somebody is j just trying to com combine this one with the gun architecture that we are currently having. But you may, tr you may try to wonder why the earth mover distance could become something like that. You see that the, you, uh, so the first thing is that the distance measurement is something given by the, sorry, question? And Uh, the distance between two peaks, right? Yeah, it, it is, uh, uh, the, the example here is pretty a simplified version of the true case. In real case, you could, you could imagine that you have a Gaussian here, you have another Gaussian here, or whatever distribution it should be. Like this is your real distribution, this is your uh, generated modus output distribution. And we are, what we are trying to see here is that if you are using the Wasser stain distance, distance between these two, it could provide you some more, excuse me, some more uh, interpretable distance measure between those two distributions. Otherwise, you could see that the GS divergence and also the KL divergence could not even handle this simplified case. However, the, the earth mover is acute. Did that answer your question? The true distribution is something, or it's the goal of our guide, right? You, you could, could you, uh, the true distribution is something that we want to generate our data from, and it is unknown, most of the time that is unknown for us. What we could observe is some of the data points that are sampled from the true distribution. So the, even though the true, distri true distribution is unknown, it will be desired that we could having something that generate data from that true distribution. So that is why we need a gun. We need a generative model, which is a gun here we are introducing, to try to generate something from the true distribution. But in order to, <coughs> excuse me, but in order to really generate from the true distribution, your generator needs to know what is the true distribution, right? That is why we need a discriminator to teach the generator. And you can see that from the previous example, the vanilla guns JS divergence. It's simply telling you that it is not from the true distribution, but it's not telling him how to correct its incorrect behavior. However, the earth mover distance cute. Sounds good? Thank you. Okay. Where are we now? Uh, excuse me? No battery. We just leave it. Maybe I just keep using this one. Yeah, just with it. The mic is not working. Actually, the issue is the mic is working very low in the recording. Can we just? No, the battery's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> so is it working now? now? I'm not sure. Can you it? Yeah, you can hear it, and now you're just, you got this? Try now. Okay. This sounds good. Um, 
Yeah, can you wear this one though too, please? Wear this one? Yeah, I'm trying to. I think I heard some interference. I don't know if it's by your phone or whatever, but try not to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sounds good now. Okay. I'm gonna use all those three mics, and. All right, sorry, excuse me. Uh, the microphone, he seems uh, keep not working. Anyway, uh, so we were at, yeah. We see that previously the earth mover distance is the inf of some format and we know that it's a distance measure that is something returned by the discriminator to the generator, right? And we, but however, we see that in the, but in, uh, this is the also already the W gun, but like in the vanilla form of the gun, it, the, uh, we have the max here. S but like you see the problem here? We have the max here. However, the previous one is the inf. So uh, the actual derivation of this one is a little bit out of scope of this course. However, it is simply using the K, KR duality. Sorry, again, I could not pronounce these two words. And when you see the duality here, it's simply some, the most, uh, most of the time trying to change the inf to max or inf to sooth, something like that. So this duality magically help us to change our previous inf to the soup of these two expectations you see here. And also, however, this uh, duality also enforces us that we need the D to be a one Lipschitz function. Uh, when I say the K uh, one Lipschitz, it simply means the maximum derivative of this function is one. And when we see K Lipschitz, it means the gradient of the function is at most K everywhere. So, and this kind of uh, K Lipschitz, uh, one Lipschitz, limitation of this function is enforced by weight clipping. That is the original form of the W gun. And because of this weight clipping, it's not that efficient for most of the time. And later, people have a soft version of the weight clipping or soft version of the constraints for the one Lipschitz limitation. So so here, you see that we have we add one more gradient penalty term, gradient penalty term here, and it is what it's doing is simply penalizing the gradient of this one. Oh, what's to mention? This p probability of x hat is different from the previous probability of pr and probability of pg. This is simply a probability another probability distribution, and for this one we are trying to keep enforcing the gradients of this one to be equal to one. Otherwise, we just penalize it. Just like every time we perform the regularization. And you may also see that here, we are trying to constrain this term to become one from two sides. Instead of, uh, I previously speak that we need this one, we need one Lipschitz constraint, which, which means that it is less than one for everywhere. However, experimentally, uh, impair, experimentally, this one performs better. And the author of this paper provides some of the explanations saying that this one could provi provide us some of the, uh, the, the real case, the real desired case here in this case is that we want the derivatives of D everywhere is near to, to be one not less than one. So, that, that, so th that's, that's why they're saying the W gun with the gradient penalty is better than W gun. Okay, sounds good. Any question? Oh. Uh, sorry, could you repeat again what the X hat here? Uh, the X hat here, yeah, you see that the X hat here is simply the distribution uh, uh, how do I say that? So, 
So it is somewhat larger than the true distribution of the previous we are staying. You see that we are currently enforcing the D everywhere that is its derivative is equal to one. And previously we are saying that we are just sampling from the true distribution. Which one? Here. Here we're just sampling from the true distribution or the generated distribution. Right? So, so you can simply think, think of this one as a uniform sampling from everywhere, every feasible, output, feasible input of D. However, previously we are, we are still considering two, two distributions. One is the distribution output by the generator. One is the distribution that we want the generator to learn, the, which is the real data distribution. Uh, it is. It could be the. It, it should be something that is a little bit larger than the joint distribution of the generated output distribution and the real data distribution. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Uh, so yeah, that's all for the double gun. So for the. If there's no question, I'm going to move forward for the conditional gun. What the time is it, by the, by the way? 30? Great. So for conditional gun, that is, yeah, we also have a story so far here. So just trying to ask a question, what's the input of our generator? Any answer? Yeah, some latent Z, right? Some latent Z that is from the latent, latent prior distribution that might be like, most time that is a Gaussian distribution, right? Great. So with the input of the, with the only information that, of, that we know that the input of our, of our generator is just something sampled from some Gaussian, Gaussian, late, Gaussian prior distribution, right? And if we, if, we know, if we already trained a gun, like whatever the gun it is, the vanilla gun or the double gun, and luckily it converts or it works and it could generate great results. So I want to, real, I want to use this one into the real case, like for example, to generate my selfie. And so what to do, I mean, how could I tell the gun, how could I tell the generator to generate my selfie instead of a dog face? If there's any way. All right. As you could think that it's a, it's a little bit hard. And that's why we have another thing called conditional gun. You can see the function, the loss function here is pretty similar as the previous vanilla gun's loss function. That is because at the point of the first paper of the conditional gun, the double gun has not came to us yet. However, the only changes of the loss function here is simply having a given, this given thing here, right? We are having, instead of dx here, we have the given y, what's the dx is? And instead of, instead of, DGZ here, we have the given Y, what's the GZ is, and give it to the D. And intuitively speaking, it is, what it's doing here is simply telling the discriminator what we want. And the discriminator will then, using the Y, like you can see, this is, you, you just ch ch take this as a Y. The discriminator will take this Y and see the output of the generator to see whether first this output is a real data and then whether this output is kind of relative, related to the Y here that we are given. For, uh, the, the formulation here, uh, the formulation of Y here and also the output of this discriminator here is pretty flexible. So that means that the, the input here, it, you could input like one hot vector if you are like, you are, if you are training on 
t on minus uh, on m least, which is just one to ten, right? You have a ten length ten one hot vector indicating which digit it is. That's ten digits first. Anyway, uh, or you you could have an input as image here. So yeah, and yeah, on the slides that's everything I've talked about. That is the discriminator want. We only give the real data that feed the condition information a high value. And the generator wants to generate fake data, but the fake data is kind of look similar to real data, and the fake data should be related to the given information vector, which is a Y here, right? And also, as I have mentioned, it's the uh, the formulation of the conditional gun is pretty pretty flexible. For why we could have one hot vector, we could have real images, and for, there are tons of things that you could do with wise representation, as previously covered in our lecture. And the output of the discriminator is also something that is flexible. That is, you could have one score for both whether the given input is the real data and related to our Y. Or you could have two scores, one indicating that it's real data, one indicating whether that is related to our Y. Uh, this conditional gun could have a lot of uh, different applications as mentioned here. You could have text to image, image to image, speech enhancement, video generation. Any question? All right, if there's no more question, we have some, the final part, the guns progressions. You might have already seen this slides in the lecture, in the part one of this lecture, which is from, with the increasing number of the year, the quality of those images are getting better and also the resolution getting higher, right? So from the 2014, we have the original gun paper, and later we have the conditional gun, the first conditional gun, which, which is validated on the Amnis data set. Later we have different kind of guns, and double guns happens here. And sought after, we have the double gun GP, green name penalty. Gradient penalty version, of, penalized version of the W gun. Yeah, that's all of this quest, uh, this lecture. Any questions? Yeah, that's some. In, actually, that's some experimentally experienced. Like, you see that from here, this thing, like because we use this duality, the one Lipschitz constraints on the D is very strict, right? Every wear of our D, the gradient should be less than one, not close to one. However, but you can imagine that every time we have this kind of hard constraint, people just modify it to soft version of the constraint just like what did in the hard SVM or soft and soft SVM. So people just modify this one, make this formulation that is kind of similar to the uh, Lagrangian. And, and also, by the way, the author also reported that the experimentally performance of constraining this one, constraining the gradients always less than one the performance is not as good as the, this formulation that puts it equal, kind of near to one from two, from both sides of one. Yeah, and that's just some experimental results. And oh yeah, uh, the this, this student is asking is asking why, why, why the why the gradient 
Oh, what's the intuitive for the gradient penalty here? Constraints the D gradients from both sides to near to one instead of the constraint, the one leaf shift constraint here that is make sure it is always less than one for every point of X. Any more questions? Any more questions? So yeah. Oh. Yeah, but it's done, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, it's fine. You can have it. We could end it earlier. Yeah, but the picture is also fine. Right? Yeah, if there's no question, this is yeah, the end of this lecture. Yeah, leave the classes over for today. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for joining us.